But our final presentation is by Associate Professor Genevieve Dingle, who I'm very honoured to be um, intro introducing. Um, Genevieve will discuss the evaluation of several social prescribing programs in Queensland. This presentation will include tips on engaging with services, accessing participants, timing of assessments and most effective measures and methods for clients with different abilities and needs. Her talk is called Tips and Hints for Evaluating Social Prescribing Programs for Loneliness. Now, Associate Professor Genevieve Dingle is the Associate Professor in Clinical Psychology and Director of the Clinical Psychology Programs at the University of Queensland. She's also a project lead of the research Ways to Wellness program, and her research focuses on how groups and communities can influence the mental health and well-being of adults of all ages. And she's particularly interested in music and other arts-based groups for mental health. How exciting is this, particularly two years after the pandemic? We're all waiting with bated breath. So welcome, Genevieve, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you so much, Deidre. And I'm just going to make sure that um, my slides are working here. Um, can you see that on your screen, folks? Looking great. Okay, yes, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so yes, thanks to Deidre, Raina, Judy, and all at Bolton Clark for the invitation to this um, really interesting lineup um, and panel discussion with you all this afternoon. Um, I'm joining you from Brisbane, so I did want to just acknowledge that um, I'm on the, the land with traditional custodians, the Yagara and Turbul people, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, I will also say that this is a very, um, the tips and, and hints kind of idea is a very practical um, beginner's guide. So for the more advanced um, epidemiologists and psychologists and whatnot researchers, um, you may need to go and get yourself a cup of tea at this point. I'm really pitching it more at the social care workers and organisations that may be joining us this afternoon. Okay, so I, th I started off with thinking about the advantages and disadvantages of different um, evaluation methods. Um, so as a psychologist, we often uh, go straight to self-report measures, so paper and pen surveys, sometimes online surveys, sometimes they're delivered over the phone. Um, we will also be thinking about interviews because we find that a number of people who have various good reasons why they can't um, or don't give consent to do self-report surveys are still happy to tell their story. So do more of an interview-based um, feedback and then you can do a qualitative analysis with the transcripts. So that could be individual interviews or focus groups uh, like some of the previous speakers have spoken about. Um, we can also make use of operational level data. So that's things that are collected usually at uh, a social prescribing service or a, a community service that might be involved in social prescribing. So that would be um, client demographics, their referral sources, um, how often they attend, whether they've been um, referred on or linked into other services. So that sort of more operational level data can be collected um, by them. And then we have to be very mindful, and a number of speakers have already spoken about the digital divide. Um, be mindful of ways of preferred ways of communicating. So we know that, for instance, a lot of older adults feel um, not so well connected and au fait with using internet technology, mobile technologies on phones, etc., and can feel overwhelmed if something's not working for them. Uh, they may be much more comfortable picking up a telephone and just speaking. Um, whereas our younger folk, and particularly the research assistants that I've worked with, would would rather die than pick up a telephone and have a face-to-face -face conversation. So we're, we're looking at sort of cohort effects there in terms of preferred um, methods of communicating. So those things are also really important when you think about um, developing a research evaluation. Then I think we should think about that the, the methods and the measures that you're using should be guided by what questions you want to answer. So either yourself or, or the organisation that you're working with. So some examples, um, fairly common ones like, does this program work? And then if so, how does it work? And then who does uh, the program benefit? 
and maybe how long do those benefits last? So let's unpack some of this and look at what implications these questions have for um, how you're doing your questions and, and what you're actually asking. So the first one, does this program work? So here you might be looking at changes from pre to post program, so at least two assessment points um, on key outcomes like loneliness, like well-being, like perhaps use of health services, maybe it's community participation. So there's a range of different types of outcomes you might be interested in, but these would be some of the, the key ones. So even with, uh, and there's a huge number of loneliness measures, which I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, um, but I would just say that some of them are quite overwhelming for older people to um, work through and make decisions about. So here's a very simple one that I have used with older adults in some of my studies. Um, it's only three items um, and it's only three ratings, um, rating points on each of those items. Um, and you can actually speak it through to them. So it's actually done as if you're delivering it on the phone or face-to-face -face, um, in an interview style with the person. So that is much easier for an older person, particularly a frailer older person who might have a number of health problems uh, to be able to respond to compared to say, you know, a 25 item scale that has seven rating points that they have to try and decide about. So if you can find a shorter scale with maybe a yes, no uh, response or even a three point response that's preferable, then I'm using a very huge scale with lots and lots of decisions to be made. Uh, here's a commonly used one, the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Health and Wellbeing. So um, this is the shortest form that's currently validated and the, the link at the bottom of the slide there um, will show you uh, some more information about this scale. Um, one of the reasons that I like it is that it's positively worded. So it's just getting people to focus over the last two weeks, which for most people is reasonably easy to sort of cast your mind back for two weeks, whereas the last six months might be, you know, that's that's gone. Um, so you can see that the items themselves are talking about positive experiences, feeling optimistic about the future, feeling useful. And here I've just broken my own guideline by saying this is a five point rating scale, but most people would be able to, to point to somewhere on that scale. in the wrong direction. All right, so, so the limits to that approach, simply taking a pre and post and seeing if anything's changed, um, has some limits. You might find that on average measures of loneliness go down a bit, measures of well-being go up a bit, but not for everyone who attends your program. So really, how do you know that it's the social prescribing program that's creating that effect rather than some other factor that those particular individuals may have also uh, been exposed to? So. Maybe they've started a new volunteer role or paid role. Maybe they're in a new relationship. Maybe they've started taking medication. Maybe something else has changed in their life. So you really don't have enough information if that's all you're doing to, um, to be totally sure that it's the social prescribing that's creating the change. So asking the second question, how does this program work, which is looking for mediators. What are the, the mediating um, changes or processes that um, that starting a social prescribing program is linking you to those, those positive outcomes. So here's where we're measuring and analysing theoretical constructs that might explain how some people are benefiting while others don't. So in our project, um, we're testing a social identity approach to loneliness, which you, you heard Kath present on earlier today. So this approach says that it's uh, the number of groups that the person belongs to, particularly those important groups that they are identifying themselves strongly with, that leads to the increase, um, that should be decrease in loneliness, decrease in health service usage, increase in wellbeing, apologies for that. Um, and it's through these uh, group-based resources, psychosocial resources like um, increase in self-esteem, increase in feeling a sense of meaning and purpose, feeling competent and valued, a feeling of control and autonomy. So some of these things that happen when, when you're in a group of people that you're identified with are what is going to um, end up uh, decreasing your sense of loneliness and increasing those other um, outcomes. 
So to measure these sorts of things, what we use is a simple group listing. So you can limit it to a number. We've got an example here where it's, you know, list up to six groups that you belong to. Uh, there are other ways of getting hold of that information. Um, and you should explain to them too what we need, what we mean by groups is psychologically meaningful groups, which could be your family, it could be um, your your faith based group, it could be uh, other community groups, sporting, all that sort of stuff. And for each of those groups, you then ask the person, you know, how important is this group to you? Is this not very important, very important, somewhere along the line um, on that rating scale? And these are some one item, so very simple measures of those um, potentially important mediators, the psychosocial resources I've just spoken about. So things like I have good self-esteem, I've been able to speak up and act on my own beliefs, which is a sense of autonomy, um, competence, relatedness and connectedness, feelings of control, feelings of meaning. So there are a number of single items that you could add there, depending on what, um, what you think is going to be important. Um, and just a little bit more on that group identification. So this measure by Dosha and colleagues is, is quite commonly used in this area of research. It's simply a four item measure where you substitute the group or community you're interested in into um, the wording of each item. So for this example, it might be your local community. It might be the, the group that they've actually joined. Uh, it might be a therapy group. It might be a choir. So you just substitute in the group of interest into the, the items. Um, and this rating scale is from strongly disagree uh, through to strongly agree. <clears throat> Excuse me. So answering the question of who benefits from this program, you're really looking there at moderators and moderators are usually fairly stable things that are to do with that individual or perhaps contextual factors that are unlikely to change so much over a period of time. So often this is demographics like age, gender, racial or ethnic group, relationship status, employment status, housing stability, but it might be things like how severe was their loneliness at baseline, whether they had other diagnoses of health or mental health problems. So other things that could potentially change over time, but differentiate the people that are coming into your program. So you might be looking for, is this program benefiting some people more than others? Some of our anecdotal um, findings in our project, for instance, are that we're really pitching it best to the people in a sort of middle ground on loneliness. So for the people who are uh, quite low on loneliness or sort of low to mild, they don't really need an intervention so much. So then they're not really as engaged in getting to the social prescribing and giving up their time. At the other end of the scale, the extremely low, um, extremely lonely folk, they often also experiencing a lot of other complexities and barriers that prevent them from adequately engaging and attending and getting the benefit. So we're really looking at sort of that middle ground in terms of severity of loneliness at baseline. So a little bit more on that, and I know some of the previous speakers have mentioned some of these, the barriers that prevent people from benefiting from social group programs. So stigma is a big one, and I know this was mentioned earlier, but just don't use the word loneliness in your advertising and your recruitment because nobody wants to put their hand up um, for that. Turn it around into something more positive. So would you like to connect to other people that are interested in similar things as you? Because that's all of us. Um, things like poverty, um, the need to be available for casual work hours, uh, so an unwillingness to commit to a group that meets at a certain time for, you know, 10 weeks in a row in case some work comes up. Domestic violence was a big one so far that we're finding in our project, so just not feeling safe to leave home and, and do something that is um, of your own uh, choosing, I guess. Even practical things like, is there public transport or does the person have actual mobility issues accessing the space where the group program is running? Social anxiety is a huge issue. So that thing of, uh, I'd quite like to join this group, but I'm not sure that I'll fit in. I don't think other people will like me. They might judge me. I just am not going to take that risk. And of course, depression. So yes, I'd like to join that group. Um, I probably would enjoy it, but I just can't get it together today. I have no energy or activation and motivation to, to go through with it. So we are looking at some members of my team, Dr. Leah Sharman and PhD student Sean Hayes are currently leading two separate analyses. Um, that is the connector or link workers perspectives and the client's perspectives 
of the barriers that they are encountering to joining groups and then the strategies they're using to overcome them. So another question then of how long do the benefits last? So this really speaks to what is the best timing of your assessments if you're doing a sort of multiple assessment point um, design. So we think from the, you know, the, the work that we're doing, but also previous similar um, studies that you're likely to find the most change in the early stages. Um, so from having not many groups to having a new group through the social prescribing, you're likely to find some bigger changes in that early phase. Um, but we, we would also want to know if those changes last over the longer period or whether they perhaps um, return back down to baseline over a longer period. So ideally you would be looking at sort of four time points like this. So time one being um, when the person is first referred to a connector or a link worker. The second time point when they're successfully engaged in a group program. And that is certainly not a simple process as we've seen some of the earlier speakers speak to this. That is a whole process in itself. So I was really just saying that we had we were quite ambitious when we started our uh, social prescribing evaluation and we thought we would do three and then maybe four time points and we've actually scaled right back to just the two that are highlighted there in the red, um, partly because there were so many COVID interruptions uh, to groups being able to go ahead anyway, but also partly because it was quite difficult we found being located outside of our partner organisations. It was hard for us to access um, people between the time that they were referred and when they were engaged to a group. There often wasn't a lot of time um, and it also was extra burden on the link workers to be sort of liaising with us and for us to follow up and contact and arrange a time, you know, to do that first assessment. So we actually found it was more successful to just book in ahead of that first group session. Um, and again, eight weeks later, and then we're doing some um, optional interviews at a longer out, outcome, uh, which we're now calling time three. So kind of feasibility uh, and simplicity are very much key to this kind of work. The methods are also guided by your participants and partner organisations. So I have sort of foreshadowed this a little bit at the beginning, but thinking about the average age of the, the service or the population that, that you're working with, um, whether there might be some visual and or hearing impair impairments, whether there might be cognitive capacity to consent and com complete measures. Um, English language fluency is a big issue in our project because we're running in a couple of suburban areas where there are a lot of English second language um, groups that are in their older age group now who would really love to participate, but it's a barrier to them being able to easily um, complete, say, pencil and paper measures, for instance. And then, of course, if they have multiple health issues, they're on lots of medication, they're fatigued, you know, so just even the attention span and the sort of energy levels that is required to participate in research, usually on the same day as they're coming to participate in a group program, that's quite a, a burden um, that we're placing on our folks. So I won't go on, even though I was nearly at the end. I did just want to acknowledge that this is very much a team effort. So to everybody in my team that's shown on the slide here, Leah Sharman, Sean Hayes, Kath, Alex Haslam, Yolanda Yetten, Neve, who's at Nottingham Trent in the UK, uh, Tegan, who's at ANU in Canberra, and of course to our partner organisations, Mount Gravatt Community Centre, Inala Primary Care, uh, PCCS Gold Coast, Complete Care Doctors and Upbeat Arts, and to of course support from the ARC for a linkage project.